David Cronenberg's Cosmopolis opens with the image of paint splattering on a cloth, the suggestion of resistance against an indifferent majority. It will come to define the lean and impressive dystopian satire that follows. It has also come to define the years of political engagement since the film was released in 2012. Descent is paint on an unyielding canvas. We can hope to change its color, but not its existence. Cosmopolis is about a billionaire savant named Eric Packer, played by Robert Pattinson. He's a Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk type who can't recognize human life beyond where it fits in his portfolio or his schedule of self-aggrandizing meetings meant to shore up his unfaltering belief in himself and the false reality that keeps his image in place. That reality is immediately signaled by the green screen windows of Packer's limousine. He's on his way to get a haircut, a service that only human hands can provide. The haircut reminds him of his childhood, the beginning of a life where all service is performed for him. Your father did not tell your mother until he had to. He went fast once they found it. He was diagnosed and then he went. You was four years old. Five. Exactly. And you? You keep him well? Uh, <laughs> you know me, kid. I could tell you I can't complain, but I could definitely complain. The thing is, I don't want to, because ain't time. Let me think what I have that we could drink. Water from the tap. I drink water now. I have a bottle of liqueur that's been here. Don't ask how long. I could drink some of that. Because if your father himself walked in here and I offered him tap water, oh, God forbid, he would rip out my last hair. <laughs> As he nears the site of old-fashioned labor, his limousine is mobbed by activists who only manage to change its color, not its existence, nor even his destination. Capitalism is a straight line, only momentarily diverted, like the readings of a heart monitor, even flatlining. It progresses. Cronenberg managed to meaningfully predict the explosion of industry as superseding political imperatives in national media coverage and in the hands and mouths of the few people with the power to do anything about inequality. The death of a humanitarian rapper provokes the only emotional moment from Packer in the entire movie. You ain't heard? What? About the feds. What? Dead. Oh. What? Can't be. Dead died earlier today. I don't know this. Funeral has been in progress all day. The family wanted the city to have a chance to pay respect. <laughs> Record label won an exploitation event. Big and loud. Street to street. Right through the night. I don't know this. How can this be? I love his music. I have his music in my elevator. Largely, he sits unperturbed, wearing his wealth like a serial killer clothed in the skin of his victims, fleeced, homeless, and angry. Cronenberg organizes the film around Packer's meetings with his inner circle, interrupted by unwelcome but ultimately meaningless intrusions by furious outsiders. What better metaphor for social media's role in criticizing political behemoths than the prankish internet celebrity famous for throwing pies at world leaders? Maybe he imagines he's doing something worth his time, or maybe he just likes being near fame. Ah, I'm after you long time. Ah, son of a bitch. I ain't look you good. <laughs> Today you are claimed by the master, Andrei Petrushko, the pastor assassin. This is my mission worldwide to sabotage power and wealth. <clears throat> Three years I'm waiting for this. Freshly baked only, you know. I pass up the President of the United States to make this strike. I can cream him anytime, but you are a major statement. Very hard to zero in you. Ah! 
Cosmopolis feels like preamble before the sexualized amorphousness of his 70s and 80s films, before the beast flesh of sensual mutants starts to creep in. This is our world, and it couldn't be clearer how it led to the horrifying blur of techno-vampires and carnivorous television, because we trusted millionaires knew what to do with all that money and all that power. They sell me the chapel, I'll keep it intact. Tell them. <laughs> keep it intact? Where? Tell them. In my apartment. There's sufficient space. I can make more space. My people need to see it. Let them buy it. Let them outbid me. Forgive the pissy way I say this, but the Rothko Chapel belongs to the world. It's mine if I buy it. Cronenberg makes a point of repeatedly placing his characters in asymmetrical compositions to emphasize their fundamental imbalance. There is always something amiss or askew, but they must pretend that they have power, that they have everything figured out. Packer is played by Pattinson like a man slowly coming down off a lifelong high, one that comes from getting everything he wants. He thrusts his figure forward at all times, an implicit erection in diners and libraries, taking whatever he wants, including dominance in the frame. To arouse a passionate feeling, we can finish what we barely started. That asymmetry will come for him in the final scene, a rogue element in the form of an angry employee who knows that under all that money, Eric Packer is still just a man, and men die. My process is symmetrical. <clears throat> So is mine. What does it mean? Nothing, it means nothing. It's harmless, a harmless variation. For that same reason, Cronenberg also fixates on the motion of hands those of the sweating prince and his consorts, to show us the Bersonian fixations and actions of the worst late capitalists. He situates greed out from the abstract and into the very real touch. Packer can't touch the data that keeps him rich, nor the heiress whose hand in marriage he bought, nor the art he covets, nor the friend he lost. As he moves through the world and loses more and more of his armor, the imaginary Proustian safety of the limousine the fancy suit, the bodyguards, the million-dollar vodka. He learns that his hands have not felt anything real. His hands have betrayed him, and so he tries to cut them off, to feel something for the first time. Like any bad criminal, he wants to be caught and held accountable, because then he might feel something approaching the power of a gunshot. Cronenberg sees this, the implicit need to tell on ourselves a sociopathic autocritique as a more important destructive force than performative rebellion. No one ever stays at the top. Every eye for miles always fixed on your foibles and failures without melting down. It may be too late to save us, but it's the rotting sliver of humanity left in the powerful that keeps them from fully destroying us. The neuroses that tie them to the poorest people in the country, just as we look at his hands repeatedly and see something human. So too must he remember that he was once one of us, even if it is mere seconds before oblivion. As blood runs down his hands like wet paint, he realizes there's nothing he can possess that can't be taken back.